Okay, the last video for this week, for day four, is beginning to take a look at discernment and worldview a bit. You're going to be reading a novel here in the next couple of weeks called The Alchemist, and hopefully you have that in your possession already, so you'll need that for next week. So make sure you have that. You should have gotten that with your text for the course. So we want to define those terms a little more clearly and a little more in depth so that you just have some background going into this novel because you're likely going to find you need to use discernment and you likely will find that the worldview of the novel perhaps does not line up with your own worldview. So discernment, let's take a closer look at what it is and how we can develop it in our lives. So according to the dictionary, discernment is the act or process of exhibiting keen insight and good judgment. It's the trait of judging wisely and objectively. We need to show discernment with everyday choices that we make where we go, what we wear, who we're with, what we watch, what to say. All of these things can reveal whether we are being discerning or not. So of course, for English class, we want to be discerning about what we read. And there are some books and pieces of literature that just aren't worth taking the time to read. But you're going to find that there are pieces of literature that you are asked to read for classes, um, maybe high school or university, that contain ideas and values that are not in line with what God says is true. And that's where we, the real discerning needs to take place. We must be careful not to be like um, young babes, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there, and by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. That's coming from Ephesians 4, 14 to 15. So that's our goal, is to be discerning. <clears throat> Sometimes we think that we just need to avoid that type of literature altogether, and that's not always possible, but I think for the most part if it's filled with profanity or bad actions, um, we're best if we can avoid that. But if you look in the Bible, the Bible is full of stories of people that are doing bad things, horrible things, sitting against God and against each other, and yet the Bible is still good for us to read. So, um, you see, the Bible is not a book about great men and women acting righteously. It's a book about our loving God who extends unmerited grace to sinful and wretched people, not based on their actions, but based on his promises and his desire to forgive and to restore. So when you ask God for help with being discerning, with what you watch and read, be aware that there are more subtle ideas underlying what is portrayed than be, that may be more dangerous than the actual words. So in many of the books you read during your years of education, you will find theories of evolution, relativism, and tolerance. You need to be aware of these underlying ideas when you read, in both fiction and nonfiction, even in newspapers. Sometimes it's easy to see these, and sometimes it's easy, not so easy to see. And sometimes these ideas have infiltrated our society to such an extent that we can be easily persuaded that they are right or good. And if you read in Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25, they say there is a way that seems right to a man, but the, in the end it leads to death. Jesus himself warned us to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves in Matthew 10, 16. When he says that, he says we need to be wise and show good judgment. We need to be careful who or what we believe or follow, but we need to do it in a loving, kind manner. Many ideas are presented in the media and in our society as right, fair, and good, but if they are not based on the truth of God, they are not right or good. So we must see that no one takes us captive through hollow or deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. And that's coming from Colossians 2, 8. In John 15, Jesus tells his disciples they do not belong to the world, but have been chosen out of the world. 
That same is true for every believer in Christ. We live in this world, but we have to be careful not to be of this world or be absorbed into its philosophies. So how is this possible? Well, if you look at what the Bible says about this present world, that helps us to understand things better. Although God made the world for his glory and his creation is beautiful, it is a fallen world due to sin. Now the world is ruled by Satan. In John 12, 31, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world and says that he will be driven out. Again in 16, 11 of John, Satan is called the prince of this world and says that he is condemned. John 15, 1 John, or 1 John 5, 19, it states, The whole world is under the control of the evil one. So as Christians, we are physically present in this world that is very much ruled by Satan, but we are set apart for Christ. We no longer need to be ruled by sin. When Jesus prays for his disciples in John 17, he says, For they are not of this world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is that not, not that you take them out of the world, but then you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So there is our answer, truth, God's truth. We need to know it in order to practice discernment. Have you heard the illustration about the bank tellers who are trained to look for counterfeit money? They don't spend hours looking at counterfeit examples. Instead, they spend hours studying the real thing. So it's by knowing what the real thing is that they are quickly able to identify the counterfeit. So the same is true with Christian discernment. It's by knowing the truth that we can see the lie. So the better and the more you know what's in the Bible, the easier it is to discern what ideas are not derived from truth or based in truth. So while reading, think about what characters believe and how they act. People act and do things according to what they believe. We say we believe one thing, but if that's not how we actually act, then we likely don't believe that it is really true. For example, we may say that we believe God created the world and everything in it, and we believe that everything belongs to him. We may say that we believe, like Genesis says, that everything created was good and that God gave humans charge over the animals and plants. However, if we don't take care of plants and animals and don't treat them like they are good things that belong to God, then we're not really acting on what we believe, which calls into question whether we really believe it or not. So let's look at a few deceptive philosophies that are prevalent in literature. Evolution. So evolution is the idea that there's no creator, all life developed by chance, and through time became what it is today. Uh, obviously the main problem with this is that it denies the existence of God. And why? People don't want to be accountable to God who made them and knows them. Instead, they want to take credit for everything they have done themselves or they want to give the credit to chance. Either way, they will not have to answer to God. Some evolutionists believe that God created things first, but then God stepped back and over time, they changed and developed into new things, animals, plants, and people. Evolutionists believe that everything is still evolving and changing. Many believe that now that people have evolved physically, they will continue to evolve spiritually until we become gods. So the main idea behind evolution is that the strong ones survive to pass on their characteristics and traits and the weaker, inferior things or ones will die out. This promotes that those things that are weaker or inferior are not as important as the strong. They also think that people have evolved from other animals, and so we're really no important, no more important than animals in the theory of evolution. We are just the stronger and more intelligent forms. So that is very contrary to scripture because the Bible in Genesis 2-7 tells us that God breathed into mankind. He did not do that to animals. His breath gave us a spirit that animals do not have. Jesus came to save humanity from sin, not the animals. Although the whole of creation will be freed from sin when the new heavens and earth come, in science books, the idea of evolution is obvious. It is not so obvious in some of the other literature you will read, but it is often there, so look for it. If you go to any provincial 
or national park or museum and you read the signs, you will see that time is measured on an evolutionary timeline and that events are given evolutionary causes. Do not believe everything you read. Test it against what God says. Second idea we want to talk about is tolerance. And this is the idea that people must recognize and respect the beliefs and practices of others. It says that new ideas and energy enrich our culture. It also states that intolerance is the same as hate. And the problem with tolerance is that the definition, the true definition of tolerance has been skewed because the true definition of tolerance is that somebody else can believe something different than I believe and I, I may not agree with them and I may want to change their belief, but I will tolerate them believing that way. But the definition of tolerance in today's society is that every belief is equal and that we should be willing to accept everyone's belief as equal to the beliefs that you or I hold. And that is wrong. Okay? So we do need to respect other people and not show hatred based on differences. Jesus tells us to love each other, but we do not have to accept the beliefs of everyone else. So as Christians, we know God does not accept everything. He's given us commands of how to live acceptable lives, and we need to stand up for truth. And that is very prevalent in our society today, where um, every belief has to have equal footing, it seems like, and be just as... Um, beneficial or just as promoted as every other belief. And unfortunately, in many cases, it's to the detriment of Christian beliefs that they are seen as um, the wrong or intolerant beliefs when that is not the case. Third idea is relativism. And so this kind of relates to tolerance and the new definition of tolerance. But relativism is the idea that truth and moral values are not absolute. They are relative. So they change from situation to situation. They change over time and they change from person to person. So the idea here is that what's right for you is not necessarily right for me. And so we certainly would disagree with that. God's principles of truth are for all people and um, will lead to the best lives for all people if you do follow God's truth. So the problem with relativism is that when it comes to things that God has already stated is either right or wrong, then those things just don't line up for relativism. So if God's in his word has said that something is wrong, then it is wrong no matter who does it or in what place or in what time. We need to agree with God. So to be truly discerning, we need to learn to value what God does. Okay, so that is the end of this week's lesson. So um, next week we will look forward to delving into The Alchemist. Have a good weekend.